Coming up, Proton Launch. Proton Anomaly. And I'm at Large Dangerous Rocket Ships 35. Stay tuned. Tomorrow begins right now. And welcome to Tomorrow, episode 9.21 for Saturday, June 11th, 2016. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. I'll be joined by Carrie Ann and Space Mike in just a moment, but before that happens, a huge shout out to all of the patrons of Tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are the people who have contributed $10 or more to this episode. To find out how you can help crowdfund the shows of Tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash tmro. And we're only about $22 away from our next reward level, which is... Uh, uh, as of right now, and at uh, at $1,000 per episode, we're going to open up our swag store. So you'll be able to buy, like, tomorrow shirts, tomorrow mugs, things like that. Uh, even the tomorrow pins that you guys are big, they're more like buttons than pins. They're almost they're, communicators. They're almost Star Trek. They're actually kind of cool. You, there's a picture <laughs> with Jared in them uh, from not that long ago. So uh, we'll make all of that available on our store. All right, let's go ahead and get started with some space news. Uh, first up, we had a Proton launch with Intel Sat-31 and DLA-2 communication satellites. You don't get a countdown for that one. That was uh, Thursday, June 9th, right? It just kind of was like, and boom. <laughs> Thursday, June 9th at 07, 10 coordinated universal time. Like I said, that was Intel Sat 31 and DLA 2, which are uh, ComSats. They're US based television broadcast uh, satellites for Intel Sat and DirecTV. Uh, the neat thing about this, though, isn't necessarily the payload, it's the Proton rocket itself. This is the first Proton rocket with a uh, Phase 4 enhancement. I'm air quoting it, you can't see me air quote Phase 4. Uh, it's, debuting, it's debuting a lighter structural components to carry heavier satellites into orbit, meaning the use of composites, lighter weight, and higher strength aluminum metallic structures, and a more high precision tooling system. This is the replacing the Phase 3 version that launched in 2009. And with the new design changes, the Proton and Breeze M can hoist 13,889 pounds, which is about 6.3 metric tons. Now, so that's essentially a new rocket or a new grade of rocket. And uh, so to hand that off, we'll head over to uh, Space Mike talking about some of the anomalies that they saw with this new rocket. That's right. With all of these upgrades, like Ben mentioned, they are able to loft heavier payloads. And actually, they have a little bit better aerodynamics on some of the stages as well. But with this, on this first inaugural launch of this Phase 4 version of the Proton-M, they actually had a problem on one of its upper stages, the second stage. And uh, we actually have a diagram of some of the uh, upgrades that they have done on this. And you can see exactly where they have done some of these new composites and, and, and where they've done it on the stages. But on the second stage, after the first stage, there are four engines and one of those four engines shut down earlier than planned. However, fortunately, uh, all those four engines can gimbal or pivot up to three degrees, which was enough to compensate for the loss of one of those engines. And then later, the fourth stage, the Breeze M upper stage, initially fired its engines for 34.57 seconds longer than planned to compensate for the anomaly on the second stage. So that the payload could reach its intent original intended parking orbit before doing a multiple series of burns uh, with the Breeze M upper stage in order to get that payload into its final geosynchronous orbit. So pretty cool that they had, uh, this is just another example of another anomaly that we've had with an engine shutting down early, but another case where the upper stage was able to compensate for that and still deliver the payload successfully. So very cool. This is a show with noises. So uh, you've got your dog barking, right. and then we've also, that's all right, uh, a Swift, what is it, Swift Kiwi 1990 uh, in the chat room says, just pause the show, guys. Baby is crying, so that's all right, Swift Kiwi. We'll wait. Oh, okay. Just let us know when we can go again. <laughs> <laughs> Poor thing. <laughs> Aww. Next up. <laughs> so mean. You can pause the live streams, too. Or, mm -hmm. as someone mentioned, wireless headset. That's kind of awesome. Um, EOR3061 says, more precision tooling systems. Uh, oh, you mean the Russian Navy gave up some manufacturing on those Toshiba mills. <laughs> you know, I, I, they no. I mean, the Russian Russian rockets are fairly um, they're fairly reliable. I I mean, okay. So they've had some issues recently, but the Soyuz has been flying for 
forever. And this isn't a Soyuz, but as an example, it's been flying forever. So I don't know. The Russian rockets have been doing a really good time. <laughs> well, right. Oh, I mean, uh, do you disagree? No, 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 no. I completely agree. I was just saying, since the 1950s, the uh, the first uh, two stages of the Soyuz have been have been flying ever since then, and have haven't had a whole lot of changes uh, uh, over the years, and very reliable. And uh, and you know, just like you said, Proton has had quite a few problems recently over the years, but hopefully, with uh, a lot of these changes, they'll have. The, a greater level of success. With this more pre precision tooling, I was reading up on it, and the way that they were able to manufacture the second and third stages actually allow it to have a lower tolerance when it comes to stress levels. So they hopefully won't have any rapid unplanned disassemblies uh, in future launches, and we'll be able to hold up to uh, a little bit tougher conditions. So that's pretty cool that they're, they're able to do that with this. As Neuropilot said, the tooling's pretty good on the Russian side. The milling machines are very good. It's the QA that's kind of lacking. Well, well, recently, right? I mean, uh, it, it seems like they're going through a, a shift, uh, a guard shift, so to speak, right? A change of guard. And uh, they just need to be brought up to speed. And once they're back, back up to speed, I, I think we'll start to see that uh, reliability come back into place. People are arguing, see, saying that the protons, proton rockets seem to have a yearly scheduled failure. <laughs> so, yeah, proton's not, not as reliable as Soyuz. But, yeah, I think they'll get there. They'll get there. All right, moving around. Oh, I, I hung here too long. Uh, moving along, uh, the Delta IV Heavy with the National Reconnaissance Office uh, payload. Here you go. We have main engine ignition. Two, one. And lift off, <laughs> lift off of the United Launch Alliance. Delta it lumbers off the pad. It's not as fault. I know it's, it's a gigantic view, but office. lift off is just a little painful. It, to well, it's to. it's an all liquid rocket, so it's really really heavy, and it just it takes it a while quite, for it to get off the lumbers, pad. It lumbers off the pad. It's beautiful. That happened Saturday, June 11th at 1751 Coordinated Universal Time. As I said, that was the National Reconnaissance Office launch number 37 from Space Launch Complex 37, so 3737. This is the <laughs> second launch of, for the NRO this year. It's also the second launch of the Delta this year. Uh, because it is an NRO payload, the details of that are actually classified. Having said that, we can use some deduction to figure out we think it is most likely an Orion Electric Signal Intelligence, or ELINT, satellite for uh, observing uh, maritime and like um, sea stuff is my understanding on that one. All right, uh, so uh, it, also- I have to say though, that because it's such a rare occasion that I've ever seen a Delta IV Heavy launch. I was, by the way, speaking of, I'm gonna pause you, I'm sorry. I was there, the first launch attempt. I was out in the rain in Florida, ready to see the Delta IV Heavy. I was getting drenched and they, what was it, like a six hour window? So waiting for like seven hours for that thing to launch and it was never, I know. And then I come home, I bring the rain with me and then they launch, they launch today. So I'm sorry. Uh. No, but uh, I was just gonna say that I, it, I don't, can't remember the last time I ever saw one. Yeah. And so it looks fake. Oh, why? Not fake, but it just doesn't look like a real thing. Like I've seen a shuttle launch, I know what a shuttle launch looks like. Mm -hmm. When I see a shuttle launch, not that I see Is it just because it lumbers, so, because it moves so no, slow? No, I, I think because the, there are other rockets that have, I, the, I, I don't see a rocket that looks like that. Okay. Does that make sense? So when I see other rockets launch, and I know basically kind of what they look mm -hmm. like, and I know sort of what they should look like in the air and moving through the air, yeah, that start. that looks like a real thing. And the only other thing I've seen like that are graphics of other rockets that sort of look like that that are not real rockets. Well, so you know, there's that SpaceX conspiracy like group. I don't know what they're called. Is there a name for those guys? I, I don't know. Are you talking about flat earthers? Well, no, they're, <laughs> so they're, they are all generally also flat earthers, but they're also the whole SpaceX has never been to space and has never landed a rocket and it's all a scam. Yeah, and, and none, of, none of it's, yeah, none of it's, yeah, uh, I, nothing I is ever launched into space. Yeah, yeah, I assume that's all part of flat earthers, but I, I thought they had another title for it. So maybe that's like part I'm of I'm sorry, that I didn't, I didn't mean to, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to feed that fire. Uh, I just, it's just, I, I can't remember the last time I saw something like that, and so it, it it's so foreign to me. Mm. It, so it, it doesn't. What about like an Ariane Five? It's got the boosters on the side. I mean, it tips in at the middle. But... I guess maybe that's why. I don't know. It just... I feel like with Ariane Five launches, you can see like a lot of trees and stuff nearby that kind of give you a reference for scale. But something about those pads that United Launch Alliance and SpaceX uses, it, it, without actually being there, seeing like an aerial shot or, or a close-up shot of that, makes it look smaller than it actually is when it's actually much larger and, and I know what you're saying especially like with that footage of the launch there it looks really tiny like it could be like a model rocket or something but, but it moves super slowly anything... for being really tiny 
Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I think that's actually a common problem with all rockets is it's really hard to develop a sense of scale for these rockets. Mm -hmm. uh, using the Falcon 9 as an example, I've had an opportunity to obviously see them horizontal and vertical. And in their horizontal mode, you're like, oh yeah, that's a pretty big rocket. But when they're vertical, that exact same rocket, you're like, that thing is huge! And I don't know <laughs> what it is in the difference between horizontal and vertical, but you're, at least my brain processes it totally differently. It's and so It's, it's uh, called portrait, Finn. <laughs> yeah, I should just use my iPhone in portrait mode to grab uh, pictures of it. Uh, the the um, is it, it's just it's interesting. I think the I issue think. is you have nothing. You have you can't relate it to anything. Like yeah, there's maybe no that's... you have no context, especially yeah. in Florida where it's all like you said, it's all flat. There's no terrain. There's nothing. There's no context for like, hey, here's mm -hmm. a giant thing next to it. So. Well, Even like in Baikonur, where it's also flat there, there's like uh, various buildings spread out all over yeah. the whole launch complex. And, you know, from s particular shots, you can get a really good idea for scale of how big the Soyuz are or the protons are and stuff like that. So I, I, I don't think you really get a really great sense of scale until you see a human walking underneath one. And when you see this teeny tiny human standing, what right, you know, under the rocket bell, and you're like... Oh, that is this, oh, oh, right? So and it's just that during launches, there won't be humans walking underneath it right. because, you know, fire. Can we just build Eiffel Towers next to all launch pads so but that again, I have a good but idea? You, but you don't, but you don't, you don't have a, no, I no know. I'm, I'm reference, joking, you need, yeah. All right, so let's move along. Uh, so uh, Firefly sent out a tweet, check this out. Firefly Space Systems sent out this Single, singular tweet says, the first of 12 engines has been mounted and tested on our Aerospike Live ring. So we also grabbed just that image to give you a higher quality version of it. Looks so Isn't amazing. that awesome? Yeah, absolutely. It looks absolutely incredible. Here's the thing though, that's not the whole engine. It looks like it would be, but it's not. Their engine actually looks more like this. It's a, that's one of the outer rings that go around the outside. Oh. And yeah, so this is part of the FRE2 engine for the Firefly Alpha vehicle. It's known as a plug cluster aerospike engine. It uses liquid oxygen and rocket propellant one, although they're working towards a liquid oxygen and methane engine. And what, what's going on here is, uh, go back to the other image for me for a second. Uh, so those, all of those combined mm -hmm. will make up the one rocket engine. And in a traditional rocket engine, you've got a skirt or a bell on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And that's where all of the fire goes through. And uh, that's kind of a necessary evil for rocket en engines to kind of, um, we'll say, shape the fire in such a way that you get the optimal thrust. The problem is, as you, um, as you ascend, through, and I'm done with that data, as you ascend through the atmosphere, um, the shape, like the, the pressure outside the vehicle changes. And so you'll end up, you know, you have like perfectly optimized fire. And then as you watch any rocket engine uh, ign uh, lift off, as it gets through lower and lower pressure, you'll see the fire start to expand. And as it is expanding, you're actually losing efficiency. And then you stage the vehicle, they separate and you get a, you know, a optimized engine again. So what an aerospike engine does is it actually uses the aerodynamics uh, of the flight to basically create and um, a mostly optimized engine bell throughout all stages of ascent. So at a specific pressure, it won't be as optimized as a as singular engine bell, but through the entire flight, it's actually changing because there's there's nothing there. It's just using aerodynamics, and it's more more effective all the way through the entire flight. I hope I did a good job of explaining I, that. I, I got it, but Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah it's, it's it fairly... I'm trying to use terminology that anyone would understand. So that's what they're working on. And it's, to the best of my knowledge, no one has ever launched an aerospike. We've tested aerospike engines before, mm -hmm. but I don't think everyone's ever actually flown an aerospike engine. So that could actually be pretty cool. So we'll, we'll see uh, We'll see how it goes. Uh, Firefly Aerospace Systems, they're actually located in Cedar Park, Texas, which is middle-ish of the, I almost said of the country, <laughs> of the state. Well, Texas thinks they're their own country sometimes. So. <laughs> <laughs> they were at one point, yeah. <laughs> in the middle-ish of Texas. So, uh, yeah. That's funny. Yeah, I like it, though. <laughs> That's really cool. Oh, no dying, Mike. All right, moving right along. Um, now, let's excuse talk me. about Red Dragon. Ah, excuse me. So, NASA is exploring additional options for NASA, or excuse me, SpaceX's Red Dragon mission in 2018. Now, NASA, back in April, already announced that they would provide technical support to SpaceX. Excuse me. And in return, SpaceX would provide all of the data that they would get during entry, descent, and landing of the Dragon capsule as it's going through the 
Martian atmosphere and using its rockets to try to land safely. And there's two different offices within NASA that are looking at ways to further collaborate with SpaceX. The first one is the, the Office of Space Technology. And what they're hoping to do is fly payloads on the Dragon capsule, specifically in pseudo resource utilization experiments, where they would try to take the Martian soil or whatever sort of elements that they can get and try to extract water or useful chemicals out of, out of the Martian soil and Martian rock, hopefully to be able to get potable waters for drinking or to be able to use it for rocket fuel. So these are really interesting experiments that they are going to be doing several type of in-suit resource utilization experiments on future landers, including the InSight lander, which is also launching in 2018. And with this, the other office of uh, NASA's Planetary Science Office is coordinating with SpaceX on how to best do that. Both spacecraft, both the um, uh, SpaceX's Red Dragon and the Mars InSight lander would need access to the deep space network in order to communicate with Earth, especially during the critical phases of entry, descent, and landing. And since this is a really heavy payload, the Dragon capsule, especially if it has additional payloads on board, NASA is very interested in the data that they would get from that since they have their own plans of landing very large payloads onto the surface of Mars. So the more that they can collaborate, the better. Better. And in the future, they might even lead to contracts where they are even paying SpaceX to fly some of those payloads to Mars. So this uh, can only lead to more good things and is another example of further collaboration between NASA and SpaceX. And even if no payloads are ready to fly on SpaceX's first attempt when they try in 2018, NASA will have payloads ready, or at least hopefully, uh, funding funding provided uh, in the next launch window. So very good news, and, and uh, hopefully we'll just see a lot more collaboration and more cool things happening. Speaking of cool things happening, on May 8th, um, April 8th, not May 8th, uh, SpaceX launched the BEAM module, which is the Bigelow Expandable Activity Module, up to the International Space Station. Then on May 26th, they attempted to inflate it, and that did not work. So <laughs> they tried again on May 28th, and it worked. And as, on June 6th at 0847 coordinated Universal Time, this happened. Boom, they've entered the beam module for the first time. That's astronaut Jeff Williams and cosmonaut Oleg Skiriposhka. Hopefully I said Skripochka. that right. Yeah, there Skripochka. you go. Uh, entering the beam module for the first time. Now, the wearing masks, that's a normal procedure anytime you uh, have a visiting vehicle, essentially. Uh, and actually some inside shots inside of beam, which I thought were really cool, really cool right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they're currently they're going to collect air samples and begin downloading data from sensors on the dynamics of beam's expansion itself. Maybe try to figure out what happened that first time. And this beam module will be up at the station for approximately two years. Now, they're not going to use it as an active living space. It's just kind of there for a test. So they'll go in and out once in a while to grab those measurements. Uh, but yeah, this is uh, kind of the, the beginning of expandable habitats out in space, which is a pretty neat thing. This yeah. footage, though, looks like the beginning to a scary movie. It does, kind of like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know what happened on the space station. It's sort of like. You see like a bloody hand print down the <laughs> side. Kind of, oh. <laughs> it's still really cool looking. Sorry. I expanded uh, about twice its size. I don't have these numbers in front of me, but I want to say it was, and I'll have to use the U.S. metrics because that's what I kind of remember. I think it was like uh, eight feet con collapsed and then seven or 14 feet expanded or something like that um, um, wide. And then it was like, uh, what was it? I think seven feet. I'm sorry, deep and then seven feet wide and then another 10 feet wide when it was uh, fully expanded, something around, along those lines. Those numbers are probably not yeah, exact. Yeah, it looks like, uh, you know, an Do average... you know, happen to know, Space Mike, off the top of your head, what, what the... Uh... Now I'm confused whether the numbers that I was thinking were in the metric or in the imperial system, but I do remember that the like the final uh, ex extension that they had was uh, over seven, I believe it was 72 inches, so yeah, about seven feet, so... Yeah. It was, some, it was around there, something like that. Yeah, so. it looks like it's like the ultimate length of uh, two average humans and about the width of a human and a half. Human. So two humans by one human? Yeah, well, <laughs> human a human and a half. A human and a half. Give or take. A human and a half. <laughs> That's right. what it looks like. Uh, Space Mike, talk to us <laughs> about uh, Blue Origin. 
So Blue Origin has uh, gotten a new contract from NASA to fly experiments on their suborbital vehicle, the New Shepard rocket and capsule. And this is part of the flight opportunities program that NASA has. And with this, under the flight opportunities, individual researchers interested in flying on New Shepard can work directly with the company to submit a proposal for NASA to have that flight funded. And the flight opportunities payloads uh, would most likely be included on the company's uh, continued or rather ongoing series of test flights of the vehicle, and once it's in commercial service, Blue Origin expects to do dedicated research flights of the New Shepard separate from flights that they would do with commercial tourists. And in the future, Blue Origin does have plans to allow researchers to accompany their payloads and, and you know have the whole human-tended element with them, uh, but under the NASA's Flight Opportunities Program, they would not have that part of, of this whole program, at least until they, they figure out the, the contracts and all the legalese that would allow that to happen. And they have talked about that back when Lori Garver was the uh, uh, deputy administrator of NASA, talked about that back in 2013 of, of having that. But at the time, they were still waiting on other vehicles. And, and uh, I don't think a whole lot of people were thinking about Blue Origin's vehicle as a, um, potentially the, what might be the first vehicle to do some of these experiments on. And that's kind of looking like what the, what the case might be. So uh, once that happens, I'm sure NASA will take the steps that they need to in order to have that under the program. But still good news and lots of cool uh, experiments will be able to fly, especially ones that normally otherwise wouldn't have the funding to do so. So very cool. All right, that's our space news for this week. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we've got Jared at the Large Dangerous Rocket Ships 35. What would you call that? Expo? Launch event? What do you? What would you say? Meetup. Launch I'm event. Not... Meetup. Meetup. There you go. <laughs> so stay tuned. We'll be right back. And welcome back to tomorrow. Now, before we head on over to uh, Jared at the Large Dangerous Rocket Ships 35, I'd like to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are people who have contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. Plus, we've got our tomorrow producers. These are people who have contributed $5 or more to this specific episode. To find out how you can help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash tmro. We do our best to keep advertising off the screen and instead fund it with our patrons. That we, we don't always do that fully successfully, but that's what we try to do. All right, let's head on over to Jared at the Large Dangerous Rocket Ships 35. Jared, how's this going out there? Oh, it's going pretty good, Ben. It's a little bit windy out here and quite a lot dusty and a little hot as well. But we are at Lucerne Dry Lake in Lucerne Valley, California. We're having a great time out here playing with, as it is named, large, dangerous rocket ships. And I actually have Greg here with me, uh, one of the fine folks who's out here working at what we call LDRS, or as we will do on our show, because we have actually a no acronym policy. Uh, on our show. We call it Mark Dangerous Rocket Ships. So, uh, Greg, tell us a little bit about Mark Dangerous Rocket Ships. Well, I hope if we aren't allowed to use an acronym, we can use, at least use air quotes around the dangerous part, because that's tongue-in-cheek. We try to make everything as safe as possible here, but uh, we are all about rockets of all kinds of up to the very largest of the uh, high-powered uh, variety, and uh, you know, I and a lot of my colleagues here are uh, original children of the space age. We grew up flying rockets as kids, and uh, we never quite got over it. <laughs> We're having a great time out here. Uh, it's an opportunity. Uh, this LDRS, sorry, Large Dangerous Rocket Ships, is uh, held annually. Uh, it's the national launch of the Tripoli Rocketry Association. We're all members of the Rocketry Organization of California, and so it was our opportunity and our honor to host LDRS this year. And uh, so we have visitors from all over the country. As a matter of fact, we have some international visitors, uh, some from Australia, some from Argentina, who come to uh, launch with us and uh, sort of exchange uh, 
rocket uh, stories. So, uh, <laughs> so, so specifically, a lot of what happens out here is what's known as high power rocketry. Right. So what, what is the difference from regular rocketry and high power rocketry? Well, those of your viewers who uh, may be familiar with the small Estes type rockets or are familiar with the uh, impulse classifications, A, B, C, and so on, the total impulse of a rocket motor doubles with every letter designation. When you get up to the uh, level of high power rocketry, that would be H motors and above. If you are certified to fly H or I motors, you're considered level one. You have to have level two certification in order to fly J, K, and L motors. Just for sort of calibration, a J motor is up to 1,280 newton seconds. That's as compared with the little five and 10 newton second motors that uh, uh, you know the, the small rockets use. And then finally, there's level three, which uh, takes you up through M, N, and O classification. So up to 20,000 Newton seconds for an N motor. Woo. And uh, and so we've got, uh, we've had some launches here this morning with uh, N motors, with L motors, with K motors. It's been really quite exciting. Um, and, and of course, we, we like all kinds of rockets. Yes. And we like the little ones as well. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Um, so, high, so high power rocketry isn't something that really inaccessible to people. Um, it's something that if, if Essentially, we wanted to go out and start our own little space program, if you will. You actually could go out and maybe use high power rocketry as a means by which to do that. I think that's very true. Uh, one of the things that I've been struck by is that during my involvement in high power rocketry over the last 20 years, um, I, I've seen that uh, there's really sort of not a, a big distinction. We've got uh, people here who are professional aerospace people, and we've also got folks who uh, are across all walks of life, uh, business, medicine, all kinds of careers, but what unites them is a common interest and a common love of solving rocket problems. And uh, so as you say, uh, anyone, it's accessible, anyone who really wants to devote the time to learn the technology and to uh, sort of get in there and, uh, and and build and fly, it's it's a great activity. Excellent, yeah, and and you are actually holding a high power rocket right yeah. here. Yeah. And I'm gonna come over here on this side of you so that I can show it off to everybody real quick. So here is the rocket that you have got, Greg. Greg, can you tell us a little bit about this rocket and the things that come with this rocket? Sure, this is a sort of a nostalgia trip for me because this is a uh, upscale of a rocket that I built and flew when I was about 13 years old. And uh, so the original was only about a foot tall and flew on B or C motors. This one is a, is a high powered upscale of that rocket. And uh, I flew it yesterday on an I motor, went about a half a mile, went about 2,500 feet. And uh, so uh, it, it's, it's a great uh, fun for me to break this out and fly it. I flew it at the first LDRS that we had here at Lucerne Valley in 2001 and I thought, just nostalgia alone required me to bring it out and fly it again. <laughs> so these these rockets are recoverable too. That's right. That's right. They're all designed with a recovery system. You can see here if I disassemble it, there's a recovery harness. I actually don't have the parachute in here, but uh, when it separates, uh, the, the parachute, if it's attached, I go ahead and bring this down slowly. Some of the rockets like this one uh, don't have electronic payloads in them. But many of them do. Many of them have flight computers that control multiple events uh, during the flight. Uh, for example, we can have staged recovery in which we bring it down with a drogue chute at, at relatively high velocity and then lower it down the last few hundred feet on a larger main chute. We've also got very sophisticated electronic, electronic payloads that uh, downlink data, uh, GPS that uh, allows us to find these things when they land miles and miles away. So there are lots of uh, openings and opportunities for people with uh, sort of technological uh, interests and uh, and applications. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you, Greg, for okay. doing that. I'm actually going to call Rick on in now. All right. um, Rick is another one of the people who is helping out here at LDRS, and we are going to talk a little bit because, Rick, you come from uh, a organization called the Tripoli Rocketry Association, if I remember correctly. That's right. Or, yes. And uh, they are different from the National Association of Rocketry, uh, but they're also kind of the same. So there's two, there's two big players in the 
Pinar. Um, NAR was the original uh, uh, group, and um, as the need and the uh, desire for uh, more power uh, grew, uh, there were a group of people that wanted to stay at a certain level and a group of people that wanted to move forward to bigger and bigger and larger and more dangerous rockets. And uh, so the Tripoli Rocketry Association grew out of that and codified and made uh, safety regulations for rockets that were more powerful than the smallest hobby rockets that uh, Benar was into uh, at the time. This is, you know, going back to the 60s. Yeah. And uh, Lucerne Dry Lake, where we're at here, has been a pitch um, since, since the 60s. In fact, several of our major players in hobby and commercial uh, space uh, motors, Garrison uh, Aerotech, uh, uh, who provides a lot of our motors and has a, uh, a business with uh, uh, aerospace companies for solid rocket uh, motors that go into space, um, all started here. So they learned their craft. Um, and uh, as they got bigger and bigger, the Tripoli Rocketry Association was created and uh, codified and uh, made safe and legal um, the, the ways around the country to be able to fly these bigger rockets. And so the two associations kind of separated. And as time has gone on, um, it, it's been shown that this can be done safely mm -hmm. and fun. And so both organizations now embrace the same. Um, the organizations uh, provide motor testing. So the, the motors that we use, which are all commercially manufactured, are proven safe, and if they find something where the motors don't work right, uh, they work with the manufacturers to get that corrected. Both groups have some of their own testing facilities, and they now recognize each other's motor certifications, so that we know that we're going to get a safe and repeatable motor every time we fly. Now, both organizations also take care of liar education, so people can get into the hobby and have resources to learn how to do it, how to do it safely, how to do it fun, how to use more power, how to be bigger rockets. Yes, bigger uh, is better. That's right. To say. I mean, you know, we can fly 12-inch rockets, and we love to do that, and we have a lot of kids here that do that. But as we get bigger, we're talking 10, 15, 20-foot tall rockets, uh, you know, 6, 8, 10, 12, 15 inches in diameter, hundreds of pounds at liftoff. And here at Lucerne Dry Lake for this launch, uh, we're allowed call-in waivers with the FAA so we can clear the airspace and fly up to 19,000 feet. Woo! So this is some pretty heavy duty stuff. And as you in motor classification, you need to know more about it. Uh, you can't use white glue and tape as you can in a tiny little Estes uh, rocket and expect it to hold up to an M motor, which is going to get for about three and a half seconds. It'll shrink it to shreds. Um, so um, I'm the, the prefix of the club are basically I'm the representative of Tripoli Rocketry Association, so I make sure that we follow all the rules, use all the Tripoli certified motors, and I certify high power flyers. Mm. So when you get into it, H and I are smaller motors in space. It, you show it to me, you fly it with a nature and I motor, and if it comes back in the appropriate number of pieces, um, <laughs> I can certify you. You can you can then be allowed to buy your own H and I motors. Mm -hmm. As we go to J, K, and L, which are much more powerful and energetic motors, there is a 50 question test that tests your knowledge of motors, delays, uh, uh, chemical ejections. Uh, electronics ejections, safety laws, uh, federal regulations pertaining to using these materials in a safe manner, and uh, it requires that you pass a 50-question test, and then you can do your flight, and again, uh, you need to bring it back in the appropriate number of pieces. Sometimes uh, these rockets come in two pieces, two parachutes, and things like that, and basically the rocket has to come back and be flyable. It can be kinked or twisted or a little bit, but uh, if something didn't work right, the parachute didn't come out, the motor uh, didn't go right, um, you know, you have to. The bad news is you don't get certified. The good news is 
you get to do it again. Yeah. Right. And, again, right. and we're here to provide the data to do that. As you go beyond that to the really big rockets, uh, we have a, a technical assistance panel where um, already experienced level three flyers, which are going to do the MN and O motors, they work with you. And it's actually a project. You have to document it. You have to build the rocket. You have to show the aerodynamics, do the calculations, where you set a pressure, set a Is it going to be stable? Is it going to go over mock? With your electronics, what mock issues do you have? And you work with your TAP representative, and you actually do a project with a report. And two TAP members have to sign off on that. And then you do your, and if it comes back to the appropriate number of pieces, you can buy the most powerful motors that you're allowed to use. Awesome. So it's a little bit of a complex process, but it's something that is done because we need to have that skill set in order to actually be able to do this. And if they've been able to build the trust with all the regulatory agencies, we are self-regulating pocket. Okay. We write the rules in conjunction with the government officials, mm -hmm. and they have seen that and we have taken the lead in trying to work with them, get them educated as to how we can do this safely, and they um, have basically codified our rules into the national rules uh, so that uh, we can do this safely and make it simple for people to come out here and learn. All that stuff's done. You just have to learn about rockets. You have to just have to want to do rockets, mm -hmm. and we can make it happen for you. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you, Rick. That was some fantastic. Uh, I some fantastic insight of what actually goes in uh, with it. And John, if you want to come on, uh, just want to talk with you a little bit here since we're out here today, um, just enjoying this. So um, what, is, what is one of the reasons why LDRS, or excuse me, large dangerous rocket ships uh, is done out at Lucerne Dry Lake? Well, it's the, yeah. for this particular launch, this is probably the best open area in yeah, yeah. Southern California, or actually the Western United States for flying. Uh, we have fairly high waiver here. It, uh, Kind of clear in every direction. Yeah, it, that does help. We'll just show our viewers real quick. Uh, outside at the lake bed, you can see uh, nothing over there, nothing over there, and uh, nothing over there. Just a dust devil at the moment. So, yeah, it's a big open space. Yeah, it's just a big <laughs> open with a lot of sky. All right. So um, when you come here, what are some of the things that you should be expecting as a as a as a possible rocketeer uh, coming out to something like large dangerous rocket ships. Well, if you, if you're just getting started in the uh, the hobby, uh, you can expect just to wander around in awestruck of seeing things as the size that uh, that they are. I'm a what's called a born again rocketeer. I flew as a kid, <laughs> you know the little Estes ones, mm -hmm. and then I, of course high school and stuff got in the way and. Uh, and then uh, I got back into it by walking through a hobby store and picking up a magazine and seeing these huge things. And then I discovered that there was a, a club that flew out here called the Rocket Tree Organization of California. Immediately came out here and joined, and the rest is history. Yeah. It was 18 years ago. Nice. So uh, do we have any launches set that may be happening in the next couple of minutes? Well, we're kind of hoping to. We get a little bit of a breeze problem at the moment, so mm -hmm. we're waiting for that to kind of settle down. There's some rockets out on the pad you can see mm -hmm. pretty far out on the other side of the range control. Quite a bit. But uh, And we're hoping to, to get back to flying here in a few minutes. This, this, uh, this came up a little bit unexpectedly today. It has been coming up in later on in the afternoon, but yeah. it, it changed around. Yeah, it just kind of comes as it is. So what, what to expect is for this particular launch at this time of year, a lot of heat. Yes. <laughs> as you may have discovered. Yes. Lots of, bring lots of water. Lots uh, of water, you bet. Uh, lots of water, but lots of big rockets and a lot of friendly people. Yeah. And uh, just just to sort of summarize it, to get involved with, uh, with space exploration, because that's kind of what our show is all about. It's all about getting people excited to get involved in space flight how do you think high power rocketry can contribute that to them oh it gets you into the uh 
the mindset of the technology involved, the engineering involved, the science that is involved. Uh, we have people that uh, that do are you know in, into the professional space flight, JPL and and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Sorry about that. And <laughs> it's all that good. Are, that are wandering around. So, as far as if you want to equate it to human space flight, it's an avenue into the, uh, the you know the the uh, industry uh, that will get you into hopefully continuing an education to take you in that direction and what we're out here for. We do a lot of educating. Yeah. Now, uh, in terms of flying, how often are you guys out here flying? We're out here once a month. We're, we're here on the second weekend of every month. In June, though it went over this one, we do a, 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 a launch called Rockstock, Peace, Love, and Rockets. Yes. <laughs> and that's in June, and we do another one in November. Same thing. Those are uh, three-day launches. They last from Friday to, to Sunday. And then we do a, a kids launch, we, what we call it a kids launch, where we buy youth groups and stuff out for a two-day launch in October called October Fest. Okay. Very, very cool. All right. Well, thank you, John, All right. for your time. and appreciate it. And of course, we want to thank everybody at the, on the staff of uh, Large Dangerous Rocket Ships 35 as well. Uh, and in addition to that, the Rocketry Organization of California. And coming up at the end of this upcoming commercial break, comments, specifically your comments. We've always looked to the stars. They guide us, give us comfort, help us find our way. We see ourselves out there. When we look up, it inspires us. Long for something we don't yet know. We yearn to go there. So we venture forth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. The eagle has landed. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The exploration of space will go ahead, whether we join in it or not. Many think we stopped exploring. But we know our journey didn't end. We've only just begun. Come with us and explore tomorrow. And welcome back to Tomorrow. Now, before we get into comments from our last week's episode, I'd like to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of Tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are the people who have contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. We've also got our Patreon producers who have contributed $5 or more to this specific episode. And we've also got access to our Patreon Plus subscribers. These are people who've contributed $2.50 or more. Plus, producers and premier members will all get access to After Dark as soon as it is available. But wait, there's more. We've also got our patrons of tomorrow. These are people who've contributed between one penny and $2.49. That's right, as little as one penny gets your name in the show. If you'd like more information on how you can help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash tmro. Speaking of comments, there was a good comment from Citizen22832 in the chat room who said, bandwidth was not so good, and it was not, and I'm sorry, internet, for uh, the uh, not so great bandwidth, but the hat width was perfect. <laughs> it was 
It was that was an epic hat that Jared was wearing. I will also tweet out a picture that we have of um, what what we uh, we were trying to communicate with Jared and be like, move closer to the door. Your bandwidth is better there. And so I took a <laughs> screenshot of like That's how good. we were trying to communicate in, with him in real time. Uh, I think we got it near <laughs> the end, but I'm sorry for the uh, the wackiness in the beginning. We'll get. I think we'll get better at those remote shoots. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people are saying you should pre-record it, but yeah, I think that takes some of the fun out of live. In addition, we got to figure out how we're going to do like live communication back to him yeah. so that we can ask questions in real time, so that you guys can ask uh, your questions. And we'll talk about all of that on our next Patreon hangout, uh, which we'll have coming up uh, in July, early July. Uh, so stay tuned to your Patreon account for that. If to uh, you head, head on over to Patreon, you have to be a patron, a patron of the show in order to participate in the Hangouts. All right, let's go ahead and get started with some uh, comments from last week's show. Capcom, get me started. Yeah, so uh, last week, of course, we were talking about hashtag Musk on Mars. <laughs> Musky Mars? It's <laughs> <clears throat> a great hashtag. Hmm. And the uh, <laughs> first comment comes off of YouTube. This one comes from Shamish. I'm going to pretend that's the way you pronounce that. Uh, it says, quote, unquote, Elon time. He's simply using his native Martian calendar. Conversion ratio, one Elon year equals 1.8 Earth years. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, that actually works. It really, it does. If you go back, a lot of that timing works out. If you were to go, oh, well, it's supposed to launch, you know, the next two years. That ends up being almost four years. I, I think it. What, what it is, is, um, yeah, Elon is just so used to He's his home Martian planet time. of Mars. <laughs> that, that he's on Martian time. Wow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So there's that. Oh, my God. That's Shamish, funny. if that's how you pronounce it, pronounce it, you win the show this week for that. <laughs> Congratulations. You've won the show. All right. Next up. <laughs> next one comes off of Patreon from a John Bernstein. It says, Elon is a national treasure and should be given Secret Service protection. Well, I mean... I, <laughs> If you want him actually protected, maybe something better than Secret Service, but, uh, ooh. Ouch. Ooh. Ouch. Uh, yeah. I'm sure he'll settle for killer robots. I'm sure that'll be fine. <laughs> right? What makes oh, wait, isn't he afraid of those? Have... Never mind. Well, yeah, never I mean, mind. what makes you think he doesn't have killer robots already protecting him? <laughs> <laughs> or maybe with some oh. sharks with lasers on their head. <laughs> Tesla got a Transformers update, huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be awesome. Oh, All goodness. right. Next up. Uh, next one comes off of Reddit from Mr. Snarky Answer. Yes. <laughs> Great point. Hundreds of thousands of people and huge amounts of money spent on Apollo with very high tolerance for risk. This is how you get things done in eight years. This, of course, is actually in a response to another comment that was made on Reddit, uh, but it was kind of a more concise way of putting all of it. That's why I include this one instead. Um, because uh, people were questioning, like, if SpaceX can actually get to Mars in eight years. Uh, but And everyone, of course, always points back to Apollo. So a little bit different uh, circumstances going on there. Different, but, but the same, but different, but the same, but right. different, right? So, I mean, yeah, obviously the destination's different, and it's actually quite a bit harder than the moon. But, um, you know, uh, we're starting with a lot larger base of information and technological progress than we had um, with the moon, right? I mean, consider the computers that had to go to the moon versus what you have in your iPhone now. Mm -hmm. So, right? I, I, so w what we're able to do is just vastly superior to what, what we could do in the 60s and 70s. So, um, yeah, but it doesn't, doesn't mean it's any less hard. Right. But uh, we just ha I, I think ultimately it's, we just have to have the will to go. We have to decide that this is a thing that is important to us and we're going to go. Uh, and clearly Elon has made that decision, and the, the question is, does he have enough people behind him that have made that decision with him to enable him to do that? Hmm. Yeah, all right. All right, next up. Uh, next one. By else. the way, that should have been Mr. Snarky Question, as opposed to Mr. Snarky <laughs> Answer. I, I didn't choose the name, man. <laughs> Mr. Snarky Answer, there you go. Uh, this <laughs> next one comes also off of Reddit from Streetwind, saying, I don't believe that the schedule Elon Musk presented is overly realistic, but on the other hand, I think it's useful to present that schedule. If the rule of thumb is in project management says the early project is delayed from its original target, then the worst thing you can do is set the original target back really far, you know? Might as well target something a little less far out and then work with whatever delays inevitably surface. Uh, yeah, the problem is if you end up delaying like forever, you end up with, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, because I love the company, you end up with a Virgin Galactic scenario where, <laughs> where it's, and then it just becomes the butt of a joke, essentially, you know, oh, you're just yeah. six months away. So, uh, you know, I, they will fly and, you know, I, I, you know, they're certainly not a joke, um, but 
you just you don't want to have that ever sliding timeline. That's a bad thing. Yeah, I, I, well, yeah, but I think the point that this person was trying to make is is that yeah, you don't. But at the same time, and we've talked about that before, is that it's hard for humans to really grasp you know, the concept of, oh, this will be done in the next 30 years. Like, that's that's too, it's too far out. It's too... Well, yes, that's true. Right, too. like, you want to have an end goal. You want to see that light at the end of the tunnel. And about 10 years is a good sort of... That's about the maximum, I think. Right. right? The maximum is, is about one decade. You can't... People have a hard time thinking beyond that. And even that Whether is really Whether or not really it's realistic it. or not, I guess, is my but, point. But it, if it's not... So even Swift Kiwi 1990 says, yeah. does that mean Virgin Galactic is in Pluto years, right? Because that's right. what ends up happening, which, by the way, funny comment. Uh, but that's what ends up happening is if you can't make those timelines consistently. Yeah. So you... I guess you're allowed to miss them once in a while, but you can't sure. be consistently missing them by years and years and years. That's not to say that um, SpaceX hasn't done that either, right? They've done that. It's just this is this seems to be a bad habit that the industry is in, and yeah. I don't actually know how to fix it because uh, it's it's this this stuff's hard. I feel like something too that is kind of the beauty of this situation is unlike some sort of uh, self-imposed goal for when they might have something operational, like in the case of Virgin Galactic, in the case of SpaceX, their goal is to get to Mars during launch windows. And so if they don't make one goal, then they have two years to make it. And if they consistently miss, you know, two or three launch windows in a row, then yeah, people probably wouldn't have any confidence in that anymore. But if they miss one launch window, it's okay. They have two extra years to get whatever system system that they were working on that just wasn't quite ready to, to fine tune that and tweak everything to the point where yeah. it would be, you know, they would have even more confidence in it in the next launch window. So that yeah. repeatable launch window kind of helps like set the tone of, of when it might happen, I guess. It's also a little bit different and, and closer to Apollo in that what they'll do, uh, as Elon has said, he wants to create a, um, how did he word it in the conference, a, uh, like a a constant stream every launch window SpaceX is going to Mars. Like, he had a term for it. I don't yeah. remember what it was. Um, but basically, you know, every two years they're going to Mars. Well, even if they don't send humans, if every two years SpaceX is going to Mars, it keeps you on the radar, right? So it's like, okay, well, they can at least get there. Right. And, you know, and, and maybe at first... Almost like know, a cargo service. A car or there a you regular. go. I think that's what he referred... Did he refer to it as a cargo service? Yeah. Uh, I don't remember what he called it in the, uh, in the, in the conference. Um, and I, I don't want to put words in his mouth. But... Um, I yeah, can't but, remember either. Yeah, he, he had a specific term for it, and I don't remember what it was. But basically, um, the, the idea that, you know, every two years they'll start going to Mars, and, and scientists can start counting on SpaceX going to Mars every two years, every time the window opens, really. Uh, and then, you know, they'll just keep doing bigger and bigger things each mm -hmm. time, much like Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, where it was a bigger, bigger, bigger thing, and you saw this iterative stepping process throughout the 10 years, as opposed to yeah. you see nothing, 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 nothing. Okay, now we're going to Mars. Right. right so it's, it's a very different thing. You know what I mean? Mm hmm Yeah. All right. Uh, so this next comment comes off of our Tomorrow site uh, from SideRight. Uh, this is actually a much longer comment. We cut down a little bit and, and kind of took some pieces right out of the middle. But uh, yeah, this is just a piece in the middle and it was like three times as long. Anyway, uh, says Musk was very insistent on the 26 month periodic windows. And I can see why he would plan to send a test flight then lest he waste a very valuable window. To me, it's more interesting that he's definitely setting up a bi-yearly trips to Mars, whether with cargo or humans as a regular service. Suddenly, Mars One doesn't seem so hopeless anymore. But why would hmm. you go Mars One if SpaceX is creating a round trip service. Well, I mean, maybe he's even saying, or she, I suppose, is saying uh, that uh, the Mars One concept is not as crazy pants or as, you know, hopeless anymore. The concept itself is. Okay. Next up. I thought it was interesting. Fine. Uh, <laughs> next one comes off of YouTube. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Uh, from uh, Sean uh, Sabra. All right, Internet, how do you pronounce Sbragia? that? Sabragia? Sbragia? Sbragia. Spragia. 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 Sorry for mispronouncing your name, dude. Sean, I, actually, yeah, Sean, Sean, I'm Sean, really sorry. All right, Sean, in the comments for the next show, give us a phonetic uh, pronunciation of your last name. Spragia. Spragia? Spragia? All right. Anyhow, We're yeah. We're going to go with that. Uh, it says, uh, biggest issue to me about a Mars mission is landing all the separate pieces at the exact same place on Mars. I don't know that you need to do that. Uh, so, for a couple of things with that. First, uh, SpaceX has consistently been able to land their rocket on the drone ship, right? Which is pinpointing a landing uh, on the planet on Earth already. So, doing that same thing on a planet doesn't seem like it would be that much harder. Uh, 
I, I could be misspeaking, but you know, it, it seems like SpaceX has already figured pinpoint landing out. Uh, even so, it doesn't have to all be in the exact same place. It has to be within a reasonable distance of the location in which you are at, right? So you have to have it close enough where you can get to it, but not on top of your camp. So, uh, and the, well, yeah, no, uh, and the I mean, that's fair. That is, uh, if you plan this correctly, each time you land, you can actually start making your, your base camp larger and larger and larger and spreading it out. And then the first settlers will probably have to end up building uh, systems in between these different landing uh, zones, landing sites, whatever it is, uh, to be able to move back and forth, whatever is landed, and then hopefully use that landing area, whatever is left over from the landing area, because some of it's probably going to lift off again for. Uh, you know, just permanent settlement type stuff. But, you know, again, it, maybe they'll just build a landing zone where they'll just land the rocket, offload it, send it back up, land a rocket, offload it, send it back up. Who knows? I have no idea. I That's, truly have no idea, right? So don't cool. quote me on that. I have no idea. Right? There are two diff those are two completely different ways to go about essentially the same. What do you think they'll do, Mike? Well, I mean, even with SpaceX and NASA, you know, even though they might have a whole lot of different plans until we're actually there trying to do this stuff, that's what's going to finalize whatever plans on how that might happen. And I mean, as long as you can get into orbit around Mars and have enough fuel to, you know, change your inclination as you need to, you know, even if you, you know, miss it the first time, you just need to wait another orbit until you're in the right position in order to deorbit and have that pinpoint landing. So as long as you have fuel and you're in orbit, you can do pinpoint landings pretty easily if you especially if you already have a signal a very strong signal of where your base is so they could do a lot of stuff like that and I think that in the beginning they'll land things you know close by to each other to assemble the different pieces of a base but I think depending on the type of vehicles like with uh, with humans especially with whatever vehicle might be able to you know descend safely and get back into orbit safely that probably would have some type of landing zone and and uh, uh, kind of like a like a customs almost offload center where people would first get acclimated and everything like that so um, but again until we're actually there doing this stuff we're not going to know exactly for sure what we're going to need to do in order to have some of these ideas uh, become realities so. that's fair we don't know it's it's too early in the process still uh, good mm -hmm. comment even the experts yeah, yeah yeah good comment from the chat room Kay McCoy says we landed Apollo mission within walking distance of another spacecraft in 1970 I think yeah. we can figure this part out. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, we, we, that's a good point. We've had this pinpoint landing precision accuracy since the 70s. We've also done it on Mars with Pathfinder, uh, uh, Curiosity, uh, Spirit, Curiosity, Opportunity, all, all of these things, uh, MSL. Uh, uh, they had yeah, predetermined yeah. landing sites that we wanted to get into, and there was like a, a, a reasonable like a margin of error that they were able to get it down to, to a specific size. Yeah, and and only, for oh. each lander, it was smaller and smaller and smaller of what area it would actually land in. Yeah, if you're only like a mile or two off, that's not, that's not that yeah. big of a deal. You're still, yeah, I don't know. Yep. All right. That's our show for this week. There is actually one more comment that we're going to get to in After Dark, which we're not going to do on our main show due to language, but it is hilarious. <laughs> and so we're going to cover that uh, up next. For those of you watching live, After Dark is up next. If you're a Patreon Plus subscriber or above, it'll be available as soon as we post it online. For everyone else, it'll be available in about four weeks. Uh, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next week.